we are live hey guys hope everyone is doing amazing tonight we got another round table edition for you tonight we're going to be talking about homesteading how to expand your homestead how to start growing more food how to start raising more animals how to possibly get a homestead stuff to actually help you come up with different ideas to allow you to basically become more self-sufficient. So Chris is having technical difficulties right now from Hickory Croft. Uh, joining us tonight is Remy from Rem's Family Farm and Mike Hello. from Me and You Acres. Chris should be joining us shortly. And I hope everyone saw in my chat before Chris gets back up here. If Chris <laughs> says impending doom, everyone type doom in capital yeah. letters. And if you if he says squash, everyone type squash in capital letters. We'll have we'll have some fun. Uh oh. I just noticed Steph is uh, in the chat. Steph, if you're <laughs> listening, don't tell Chris about this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so it should be good we're just waiting for chris to come back not sure oh they're trying another computer okay um they need a link possibly let me see how i how do ooh, how do i do that here having issues there's a having issues thing can I hit that? No, we won't hit that. Maybe. Invite. Hey, there Dave from Deep South. How was spring? Coffee. You got to let us know how it is. All right. Chris, Steph, here's the, here's the link. So if you're on the new computer and can see that, then Chris can join beach. us. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. So we'll go through everybody and... We've got uh, Van City Prepper in here, Prepper Chicken, Texas, Lady Casca, Paul Andre, uh, Bucket List Homestead, Patrick Coast, Coast, Pat Patrick. Let me know how to pronounce your last name. Coast, I want to say, but uh, Angie from Me and You Acres, Mike's uh, better looking half, uh, <laughs> Renz, Ren. Wren's Homestead. Oh, man. Maybe I should lay off the alcohol. Uh, uh, Tracy from T T Hand 141. Uh, who else is here? Uh, Remy's here from Rem's Family Farm. Look at all those comments. T's Homestead was in there. Yeah. Little Homestead by the Beach. Walterstead. Uh, Honey Badger's Homestead. Uh, Hickory Croft, of course. James Urban Homesteading Channel, D's Homestead, Dave Knight, Lady Tina Bug, uh, Wildersteads here, James is here. Wow, look at that! Oh, That's people awesome. Already. Cost okay, nice learning curve acres here. Wow, thank Cost. you all for joining us tonight. <laughs> What's that? Cost Costco, but no sco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Hey, Lewis is in here as well. Nice. We got a whole big group going on. So pressure, the pressure, the pressure. So the one thing we wanted to talk about tonight, blind guy, his wife, their life is in here too. Awesome. Glad you all could join us. So the one thing we wanted to talk about tonight, uh, you guys probably saw we put out a couple videos on is it too late to homestead? No, it's not. We all feel that, you know, y'all need to jump into homesteading right away. Uh, so in a lot of circumstances, some people can't. So you might be still living with your parents. You might be renting uh, in the city, you might be in a townhouse, you might be, you might have some sort of circumstance or where you are right now in life where you can't per se homestead on, you know, one acre or two acres or three acres or bigger. So 
what we wanted to do is we've kind of like brainstormed and come up with different ideas. And we, we kind of want to give you guys ideas and tips and information on different ways that no matter where you are, you can start growing food or possibly raising animals, becoming more self-sufficient. And how, yeah. to, how to get into homesteading. Even yeah. if you're, you're just wanting to break into it, you're just wanting to learn and stuff. You made a post on Facebook, and it was kind of like a joke, but, you know, I've seen a lot of people make posts like that where they're accepting other families or other like-minded individuals to come homestead on their property and bring a yurt or whatever. It, it's it's interesting because we put that up there, and we've had lots of people talk about it and that sort of stuff. And I remember seeing the one video. Uh, I forget the name and the channel. But she basically talked to this guy who um, basically nomadic goat herder. So okay. he traveled across the U.S. and he was had four goats, I want to say. Chris is back. Yay. There you are. Oh, boy. We should have been talking about technology tonight because I've had to go through three different pieces of technology and finally, one of them wants to work properly, and the other two <laughs> go in early to make sure it's all working. And anyways, it decides oh. it wants to update or some silly thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, we were just kind of discussing, um, you know, what was the question again, Mike? <laughs> it was how to get into homesteading. Yeah. Basically, how to get into homesteading, but also Mike brought up the point that, you know, we saw my Facebook post about inviting people onto our property to kind of, you know, build a yurt or build a trailer and then kind of expand from there so that, you know, we'd give them kind of the land to use. And they'd bring their services or that kind of stuff and, and start working together with us. Um and I was mentioning there's the one channel I saw where the guy was basically a nomadic goat herder down in the U S and he would travel around the U S with his, I want to say four goats, basically living off the land. And it was amazing. The guy was like, had so much knowledge. And I, for me, I was like, okay, can you come up here, spend a week with us just telling us how you do everything that you do because he would go around and allow his sheep to basically free range on people's farms where they said they could free range or, you know, like you go buy a car dealership and they said, you know, instead of mowing the grass, can you have the sheep cut the grass for us? So he kind of exchanged services that way and he would do his own, uh, what is it? Kefir, kefir yogurt because you don't have to refrigerate it. But he also had his own little mini fridge in this little cart that he had. So he's got two, I guess, tiny, I want to say Rubbermaid containers, but it's covered in wool and he continues to spray the wool with water. So it continues to cool off these containers. So it's like a homemade refrigerator. And it was just like, all this stuff that he continued to, you know, here's what I'm doing with this and I'm doing these grains and I milk my sheep and I, it's like, and that's uh one, one, two, three home free, I think is the channel. Yes, that's yep. it. Yeah. Yep. It just blew my mind. The knowledge and skills that he had for this kind of stuff where it's like, you know, please come here for a week or two weeks or whatever and live off our land and teach us in exchange for, you know, something. It's just crazy. A lot more people are doing that nowadays where they're just, you know, come on my land. I'll give you a part of my garden where you can grow your stuff. And in exchange, you know, come water my stuff as well. And, you know, we'll work something out and, there was actually a post on Facebook uh, not too far from here, a woman that was just moving here from Ontario. Uh, she didn't really know anyone. She didn't really have time to do a big garden. And she felt like, like her land was being wasted by not, you know, being used as a garden. 
So she made a post about if people wanted to get on board with her. I mean, now there's a community garden and people are sharing their land for stuff like that. So it's a good way to start. If you never had a garden before, uh, people like mm -hmm. that might have the knowledge and teach you some some tricks here, here and there. Yeah. I noticed um, Huga Homestead came in, Urban White Buffalo Farm came in, Elizabeth B., uh, Harvey Black, if I missed anyone, I'm sorry. Welcome so much to this round table. Um, if we don't acknowledge you, I'm sorry. We're, we want to try and, you know, get as much knowledge and information and ideas out there for you guys as possible. If you have a question at all, either type question and then your question or put everything in capital letters and we'll try and hit it up. Mm -hmm. I'll say too. I'm uh, I'm blind for the chat right now, so okay. Anybody uh, has a question for the ladies are watching. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. So if uh, they can keep an eye out for anything, that'd be good to you know kind of poke us to bring something up. Yeah. So that basically, I'd say, is one of the ways people can actually start. Um, becoming more self-sufficient is kind of, I wouldn't say you'd have to go full, full nomad, but being able to utilize other people's properties with their permission and whether it be gardening on someone else's property or exchanging services with someone else to utilize what they have in exchange for what you have. Or if you have the ability to just buy a piece of land, move out there in a trailer, build a barn, stick it in the tra in the barn, and then build your house, you can do it. It's possible. <laughs> that that might just work. I think I've seen that somewhere. <laughs> oh, and says we have a question. Patrick Cost. Uh, Patrick Cost. Yes. How do you guys feel about people? You know, something getting a homestead. It's a little bit of a lonely thing. Ah. Yeah. That's a good question. Oh, that's something that uh, we've actually had come up uh, talking to other homesteaders, kind of not on YouTube, but n near us that we've we've met and, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, that it's come up that it's kind of a lonely, kind of a lonely lifestyle in a way because especially once you add animals to the equation, but even if you're just gardening, uh, you have a significant portion of the year in Canada where uh, if you're gardening, <clears throat> you're stuck. <laughs> you have to do all that stuff, right? And that doesn't always equate well to when people who aren't doing those things want to. And a lot of people don't get it. It's not until fairly recently that I think people are really starting to see the value in it again, right? Because uh, it might, it's getting to the point where uh, it might be hard in some situations to feed yourself but uh it can be very lonely uh but i think that's where I, i'm going to kind of loop this back to the, to the conversation about the, like the nomadic way of looking at it right because that's an out of the out of the box way of of thinking about how to grow food and i don't know if that's really that's not homesteading but growing food and getting those skills um but it's not for everybody because it takes you're shifting the entire way you live yeah. Right. To be nomadic, you're you're you don't you, ha you don't have a fixed tie to anything, uh, and you're you're doing everything day to day. Well, homesteading's kind of like that, but you are very fixed, and I think that's what makes it kind of lonely, in a way. Yeah, definitely for myself, I I feel it a lot because um, I think some people enjoyed the last two years because they were introverts or they enjoy homesteading because they are introverts, I am the exact opposite. I, I need to be socializing. I need to be out with people. I need to, you know, see my buddies and that kind of thing. So for me, especially after moving from Ontario to Quebec and then to be on a homestead is, you know, I go a little stir crazy sometimes and, you know, that's probably why I drink so much, but you know, I, <laughs> It's, I enjoy the lives. This allows me to uh, interact with other people. Uh, so I don't feel as lonely. Um, 
basically, yeah, it's trying to find those like-minded folks that don't think you're crazy to be able to interact with. Mm -hmm. You don't need to look very far. Most often than not, um, I mean, I started doing this lifestyle, uh, well, well, when everything started, maybe two or three years ago, actually. And it didn't take very long. As soon as I joined a group, uh, you know, New Brunswick Homesteaders, uh, there's like sales found me right away. And he's like, okay, you're from my area. You're doing homesteading. Like, where do you live? How can we meet and, you know, discuss this further and help each other out? And right away it was just like, boom, you know, like, um, and I started not too long after seeing more and more people around here, you know, hey, this person works with the same place as I do. And this person, I've seen that person before. And, okay, this person is related to my cousin. And, you know, like you start seeing a lot more people. It's like, if you're not in that world, you don't necessarily see those people. But once you're in it and you start checking for that kind of stuff, you see that there's a lot of people out there. And one of the things that we've done in the past few years that helped us maybe get past this uh, loneliness is exactly what we're doing now. You know, uh, so often we have a chat, even if it's not online, like live, we talk to each other, you know, we, we, we like to talk mm -hmm. to a like-minded person. So we know if we talk about homesteading that, you know, you guys are going to be listening and giving inputs and this is amazing. I mean, this is socializing now, so it's as good mm -hmm. as it gets, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I know I got lucky because, you know, I married my best friend, so I'm hanging out and having a good time every day. But, uh, even my neighbors, like, here's some of my neighbors think I'm kind of crazy, but it's okay. I don't mind being a little odd. I've always been a little odd. <laughs> if you want to hang out, we're still cool. Come on in. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's a different community. You're right. And this has kind of become, especially for the last couple of years, the new way to kind of socialize is everybody's been virtual, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I still make an effort to go out and try and, uh, you know, meet up with friends and stuff like that, you know, have a beer now and then. But yeah, you do get stir crazy once in a while and you know, I'll go for walks or whatever, but it's probably why I got to drink so much. <laughs> 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 no, it don't happen that often, but once in a while, you know, just to take a little edge off. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so on the, okay, so if we go with the nomadic way of being able to travel around, utilize other people's properties, other people's food, um, that kind of thing what would you say is the next step? So say you have an apartment or a, or in a townhouse or living with your parents or something like that. What, what steps would you take to start growing your own food in that location? What, what do you think would be a great idea for that? Well, there's a friend of mine in high school that was able to grow illegal plants in his closet. So if he was able to do that, I'm pretty sure anyone can grow food in their house. We, we don't need much space, really. You just need, like, a nice open window. And even if you just plant a couple of tomato plants or, uh, you know, just a lettuce, uh, spinach, and stuff like that, it grows pretty much anywhere. So you can plant that if you have, uh, even if it's just a little piece of lawn in front, just put a few, uh, you know, uh, chives in there, here and there. Neighbors won't see. It, it doesn't look like a garden if you're not allowed to have a garden on your front lawn. Uh, you'll have chives to eat. And, I mean, there's so many things that you can do like that. A lot of different ways. You know, I mean, I've even heard of people growing. There's been different documentaries and whatnot on growing tons and tons of food in a very small space i've seen people mm -hmm. that have grown enough food to feed almost half a village just in a small backyard but even cjm farms runs a it's kind of like a co-op garden on top of their building in in toronto okay yeah. so like there's there's always a way if you if you want mm -hmm. it bad enough it was told to me once before if you want something bad enough you'll find a way if you don't you'll find an excuse and so True. 
-hmm. there's always a way and if you want it you can find it before we moved out here we started trying to or well my wife did started growing in our backyard just to see you know, can we do something like this and so she began the process then and it, it's never too late to start you know you don't become a master at something overnight mm -hmm. no very good point um i think you you raised some really good uh, points too darren about there's a lot of circumstances on this really small scale, right? That are slightly different. Um, some people may rent or, or own a very small property. Uh, if you own it, then uh, outside of, like you said, Remy, certain restrictions that you may have depending where you are, you can kind of do some degree, whatever you would, would like, right? So you, you might be able to retrofit a closet or a small room or whatever, but if you're renting, or, you know, living in your parents' house or a friend's house or, you know, whatever that may be. <laughs> I think the big oh, thing no. would be, oh, like, like everybody. You're freezing, Chris. What's that? You're freezing. <laughs> oh, freezing. You left us hanging. Oh, whatever that may so be. Where did I... Oh, whatever um... that may be. <laughs> what is that? I've got to think of my thought. Um, <laughs> wherever people are living. Oh, where, it be their... wherever. Yeah, it's all related to like um, scale, right? Be... Yeah. So, so where did that cut out? Because <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all kind of stuck right where you are, Chris. Where, where did he leave off? Yeah, um. <laughs> you, were, you were saying basically, you know, where, wherever you live, whether it be in your parents' house or an apartment or whatever, wherever ah, that okay. may but be. Okay, but it wasn't that far back. You, <laughs> you, can, you can grow something. You, sh you should grow something, but right. um, mm -hmm. temper your expectations based on your uh, resources, right? Because, as I say, if you own your backyard, there's a, a channel that we followed right since we started YouTube called Guten Yardening. And he lives, he's in uh, Wisconsin, in town, uh, with a very small backyard, very small yard, period. And he is able to utilize that to its fullest. Not everybody can do that, right? But like you said, Mike, you can grow a lot in a small space if you have the freedom to do that. Uh, oh, no. I say freedom because there's no other good word for it. Um, but... And, <laughs> you keep freezing and yeah. we didn't we didn't hear the word so um oh boy technology bottom line is work with what you've got right yeah. on those on those really really small scales yeah he raises a good point though to temper your expectations um it's <laughs> it can technology? be very discouraging yeah, and technology it could be very discouraging for some people and, and like they may just fail right away because they expect that they're going to grow enough to feed themselves for the year or something and then mm -hmm. they fall way short of it because they just started in growing something um you know i know my wife and i share two different you know extremes like she's the gardener of the family but i have a lot of practical knowledge on like you know how to survive out here how to make things a little bit better how to build things and so like we each have our roles but if you if you just jump in and you're like i'm gonna grow 600 plants today and i'm gonna have them all you know canned and everything and then you grow four and then you're like i have failed no you've just learned how not to grow six you know 58 more plants or something you know it's just yeah. you have to keep going and and we all are our worst critics that way so that's a good point yeah one of the things i've noticed too is when when i started growing a bunch of stuff is like i tried to grow a bit of everything so what I'd suggest is anyone who's starting to grow stuff that they want to eat or they want to save, do, do something all the same. So my suggestion would be um, do more carrots or do more potatoes or do more something like that or make all your garden herbs because, you know, I started out, 
when I started a garden, I did uh, a bit of broccoli, a bit of cauliflower, a bit of peppers, a bit of salad, a bit of... So the problem with that is like you have one meal. Mm -hmm. you, you, you harvest your salad or your broccoli and it's done. And then you're like, oh, okay, so maybe tomorrow night I'll have the cauliflower or tomorrow night mm -hmm. I'll have the pepper. It, so my suggestion would be instead of doing that, just go with one so that not only can you have, say, lots of broccoli for a while or lots of cauliflower for a while or lots of peppers for a while, but also if you have an abundance of that, you can also can and store it. That's a that's an excellent point too because uh, in a way, like what you what you were saying there, you, that can almost be discouraging, right? When you've grown all sorts of different things, but in small amounts, to try to there, there's there's a purpose to try that experiment, yeah. But um, at the same time, because you never get enough, then you really don't feel like it was. You know, it's like oh, that was a lot of time, and this is all I got. You don't see. There Whereas was if you so focus, much effort and weeding and looking so after little. stuff and all that, and I got one broccoli. Yeah. And Whereas like if you, you know, know grew and it all boils down to like two jars and you're like, well, that's really underwhelming. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what for, so for someone who's doing an apartment or townhouse, uh, I'd also say like, start utilizing everywhere in your house. Um, like the guy said, you know, you can grow stuff in your closet with grow lights. You, if you have a skylight, use that to grow some stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Build a planter on your windowsill and use that. Do some sort of like stepped planter, different mm -hmm. hydroponic uh, on your windowsill anything like that utilize all the space you can to start growing something mm -hmm. yep and if you look around your your area there's chance that there might be a community garden also so that's another place you can go and grow some stuff we're uh, in a village here most people have a lot of land but there is still one so i'm getting extra space to grow some extra stuff not just that, but I mean, if you're really looking into going out and doing homesteading and being, you know, off the grid or living, you know, far away from civilization, you you definitely need to learn how to provide as much sustenance for yourself as you can. But you you can't overlook like simple things like, you know, how to build fires and and you know maybe how to live off grid and and survive out in the woods just so. If you have those skills, it makes life much, much simpler because they apply in several different ways. Like just being able to go out and, and make yourself a, a survival shelter with, you know, a 10 by 10 tarp and some, some string, you know, it, it can come in super handy. And then all those knot skills, knot tying skills that come in handy when you're trying to like, you know, tie things off, like tie tarps down and you know, tarps coming in so handy out in, out in the bush <laughs> and the one thing i can never stress enough if you're out building like and you've got animals and stuff hinges you never have enough hinges <laughs> hinges <laughs> are always in short supply they are for the almighty it's hinges like, yeah i think with prepping and all that i think it people need to stock up on hinges and screws because i guarantee <laughs> you when Mm -hmm. SHTF, those will be in short supply even worse. Oh yeah. And yeah. and keep your screws when you when you repurpose things. I mean, if they're too far gone, obviously not. But yeah, uh, like we have bins and bins, and sometimes we curse that why did we save all these? <laughs> and then you get to a project and you go, Oh, I'm really glad that uh I have all that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So many times. Exactly. <laughs> I want to uh welcome a whole bunch of people from showing up um uh az highland homestead uh annie at back to basics uh i know i saw some other people scott yep scott with rambling with the brooms uh harvey black uh i think i said hello to wilderstead rural prepper 
Uh, again, <laughs> if I missed anyone, I'm sorry. We're kind of like in our own little mind here. So, but welcome again. If you have a question, put question and then your question. Yeah. And then Harvey, or Harvey it asked all the in He asked me when so, I was going to grow a beard like Thor. <laughs> um, so this took this masterpiece of, you know, the, <laughs> of manliness, the, the five, <laughs> the five beard hairs that I have took about two years. So um, I'm not make I guarantee you anyone can achieve this in about six months compared to me, which took two years. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear a word. I got dead zones. Like I look like Shaggy from Scooby Doo. Have time. right here. Oh, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Shaggy. <laughs> I know uh, Patrick made a great point. Uh, I lost the the comment. I'd have to go back and find it. But he made a great point about learning to can too, so you're actually able to preserve the stuff that you are actually growing. Yes. So especially if you start growing. Um, instead of doing one-offs of stuff, if you grow a whole bunch of carrots or potatoes and all that, it's great to be able to can, to be able to put that away. And I want to say now that I've got into canning, I prefer that method to freezing because we're not using energy to run the freezer nonstop. We can just stick it down in the cold room and have it sit there. And not worry about it. Well, and the canning goes for if you're a very small space, right? You, you don't have a lot of space. This is where the prepping and the skills and the homesteading kind of all start to line up. Because even if you can't grow massive amounts of tomatoes or insert canning crop here, um, you can still learn those skills. You can still practice honing those skills, right? Yeah. Maybe you can get it from a, a local farmer or, you know, there's a lot of ways to get uh, sort of bulk of that sort of thing. And uh, they do tend to be a bit more available to be able to practice on the canning uh, in the fall when uh, everybody's got big harvests. So that's another thing too, right? That's another one of those prepping, homesteading, survival yeah. skill crossovers. You yeah. can always buy in bulk or buy something that's on sale and, you know, yeah. preserve it. I think that um, also goes into a note too about homesteading in general, because I think a lot of people, potentially myself included, love the idea or in the back of your mind, love the idea of uh, doing it all yourself, growing it all yourself. Right. But there's absolutely right. nothing wrong uh, with getting it from off the homestead. It's just, you still want to look at supply chains. I mean, if yeah. you can get it local off homestead, that's great. You know, you can, that's a whole nother discussion, but I think that's just something to think about. Uh, Amanda Fractures, welcome. Glad you could join us. Um, you touched on a few good points there. Is there, like, again, the whole homesteading name, for one, is I think it, when we're all taught, talking about it and discussed it in the the other uh, round table it, we agreed that it was like you know half acre to a hundred acres is basically good mm -hmm. for homesteading <laughs> depending on how do you utilize the land that you're using mm -hmm. oh absolutely what quality the yeah. land is yeah so i want to also come back to another point is i think it was you remy that mentioned community gardens so do you guys have any suggestions? So say a person has utilized indoor space or they have a small, they're, they're using planters out on the back deck or that sort of stuff, but they want to start growing more. What ideas do you have for them where they can start growing more than, you know, the back deck or their small backyard or inside the house might have available for them what uh, what other options are there well i have had that issue actually this year because you know i'm i'm in shed wars i want to try to grow as much as i can uh, whatever i had last year was 
really not enough. I mean, I've had carrots for about a month and I've had over a hundred pounds of carrots. So I started thinking and my dad has a big land. Uh, thing is, is uh, it's mostly woods, but there is a small place on his land where, you know, he told me if you want to go there, it's behind my uncle's place. Um, just go there, do whatever you want. I mean, plant a garden. It's not like you're going to go there and make a party and keep the neighbors uh, awake all night. You know, like, um, I, I know my uncle, if I ask him, he's going to let me pass through no issues. Um, I can go back there and, you know, word the soil a little bit and plant some stuff. Uh, then that I, I felt like this was still wasn't enough. Uh, my brother told me, you know, if you want to come and plant some beans with us, uh, come and plant some beans. Uh, there's always a friend somewhere, you know, Serge has a land not too far from here. He wants me to go and plant some stuff there. There's the community garden. Uh, my parents told me that, you know, if I want to use a part of their property right where, where uh, they're living now, I can go there and do that too. Um, I'm also looking at what I have here and I'm wondering, you know, even if I want to have some space for the kids to run out and play, uh, there's still some little spots here and there that get enough sun to plant something. I mean, I'm even thinking about in the back of my yard, there's a place where the grass doesn't grow like that thick. And I'm thinking, you know, why not just go and plant some tomato plants back there? If, if I don't have time to take care of them, so what? It's not like the bad weeds are going to take over because there's none. So I just have to put nice compost, put a few plants here and there. And what's the worst that's, that's going to happen? I'm going to lose them to some animal at some point. I mean, it's just a plus if I get them. So, you know, I'm thinking about using all those little spots I can find. Just look on Facebook. There's always someone sharing, you know, bought on their property for an exchange for a service or, you know, mm -hmm. scales or whatever. There's always, always someone. Keep an eye open. I'm going to find There's something. tons of different ways you can go about it. Because, like, if you're in, in the city, you could even go, say, you attend a church. You can ask the local church. Uh, there are tons of local places um, that, you know, would support something like that. You can even probably start up a community garden. I know there, there was one back where we used to live where – it was a list just to get in and we didn't qualify the entire time we were there. So you might have to reach out and talk to your neighbors. Hey, do you have any extra you know, land that you're not using in your backyard? You might have to travel a little bit or talk to friends and family. You know, that's the, gr that's a great idea, Remy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's definitely pending on your situation, how, where you are, what's around you, there's kind of limitless options. The one thing to take it in a little different direction, I would say though, if if you're planting, let's let's say optimally, you can plant some around your house outside, and you have to plant some in another location that's not where you're living. I would probably suggest the things that you plant in the other location. Make sure they're things like like you said, Remy, that they don't need a lot of tending. Mm. Uh, or, or that regular kind of check-in, right? It, or, or that if it doesn't produce, it, it doesn't matter because in a growing season, a lot of stuff can change. So if you take, I can't think of something off the top of my head right now, but a vegetable that kind of needs to be looked at, lettuce, lettuce, you kind of need to look at lettuce sort of every day, right? And water it, harvest it, all that sort of thing. You might not want to plant that far away where you're not going to regularly uh, tend it but squash. <laughs> oh, he paused. <laughs> oh, right that might be a really good one. To he paused right on <laughs> squash. I was basically going to say squash is a good one, though, to plant somewhere else, right? Because it doesn't take, uh, especially winter squashes, they don't take as much time and effort. You kind of plant them out, maybe look at them a few times. If you're in a drought, you might need to water them. But otherwise, what do you have to do, right? So just something to think about when you're looking at spaces to grow that are kind of, it's like a permaculture thing, right? Put the things that are, take the most time, energy, regular looking after, or just simply looking at closest to you and then work out from there. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Like, like potatoes are easy too. You just throw more mm -hmm. dirt on top of them. Or mulch. Or mulch. Yeah. yeah, that kind of stuff's Even awesome. <clears throat> 
Yeah. You know potatoes are easy yeah, to grow when uh, I a can lot grow of good potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we tried yeah, the only thing we like had to grow uh, pumpkins, and then I just threw a couple pumpkins that we had carved for Halloween out into the patch, and then they grew a huge pumpkin patch next year. <laughs> That's cool. awesome. I think the only thing with some of the stuff is um, so this year we actually had a few of the potato beetles. So, you know, we went out every day for a couple of weeks picking off those, but otherwise, you know, potatoes leave them and they're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think you guys hit on a lot of good points about, you know, talking to neighbors, utilizing mm -hmm. the neighbor's lawns if they're not utilizing them. I've seen so many places where people have mowed ha half an acre of just grass and all they do is just have a nice lawn or something. Whereas what I'd suggest is if you can talk to those people and try and work out some sort of deal where you're able to plant a garden bed there and, you know, either exchange work. So mm -hmm. you look after mowing the area that they're mowing in exchange for you planting a garden bed or you give them a certain amount of food or maybe they need you to pick up groceries because they're older or something like that. Figure out some, some way where you can utilize your neighbor's yard or a friend's yard or family's yard. Find, find areas that are underutilized and see what you can do to work those areas to make your own gardens there. I think that's, that's huge. Even if you have, even if you find a farm where you can work a deal with the farm, where you take, let's say a quarter of an acre and you put on some chickens for eggs and you can work with that farmer to be able to give them some eggs in exchange for housing the chickens there or something, you know, mm -hmm. there, there's other concerns about, you know, biohazards and that kind of stuff, but you find the right farmer who's willing to work with you and under the right conditions, it, it's possible to be able to start a farm on another farm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Absolutely. I think you've got a good point when it comes to gardening and when it comes to gardening and, uh, and plants, uh, there isn't the same concerns as there is with livestock. So I think that's a little harder sometimes to, to, to figure out or to, to find a, find something that works for everybody. But uh, at yeah. the same time, it can definitely work. Um, <laughs> there's lots of people that, Every time I talk, uh, but there's lots of people that do uh, graze cattle or sheep or uh, other things. So on other people's mm -hmm. properties, oh, he's going to bad mouth my cows again. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> no, actually, I wouldn't because that's an, ex that, that's an excellent way. Like that's a quote unquote old timey way of doing things, right? Uh, land, Very much so. you, have, you have to go back a ways, but land wasn't uh, owned the same way. And those livestock were allowed in, in sort of the commons to graze, which is very different from now. So yeah, um, that's a whole nother discussion in itself too. Oh but, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's so funny cause I totally agree with you that, you know, I, anyone getting into this, I would not recommend cows at all. Like, and, 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 and not, not right now. I have a feeling no. in the next couple of years, that's risky, but that doesn't mean, unless you, unless you have the land, that's, if That's you totally have different. the land, you have the experience with working with animals, you have a budget where you can invest in it for a number of years, then yes, maybe consider cows. But otherwise, no. Chickens, no. rabbits, definitely. Uh, pigs, yeah. Yeah, I'd suggest pigs if you're, again, able to deal with... where you are. Yeah. I think it depends Depending on your situation. On you are, if you've dealt with animals before, if you're not scared of animals, then yeah. Cause even if you're 
scared of animals, which I've seen some people are. They've gotten into homesteading and they're like, um, no, the rooster came at me. Okay, if the rooster comes at you, then you're not going to deal with pigs okay. So it's it's one of those where, you know, you spend some time with your animals working up to it. Start with the small exactly. ones and progress into the bigger ones. I've even seen... I think I talked channel. about that in the video. I've even seen a channel... Um, where the guy was raising rabbits indoors. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't see all the videos on how he does it, but I know he's doing it. So it's possible to do also. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I know he was saying that in a year, you can have more meat out of a rabbit than you could out of a cow. A cow. Because they reproduce so fast, you can keep reproducing them. And, you know, huh. wise, you have more meat. You definitely, uh, there's lots of ways you can do, I, I think there's a, there's a whole book on it called like micro livestock. It's uh, it's online. Every time I go to find it, I have a hard time, but it's fascinating because it just changes that um, um, look on things, right? It, it's like what you're saying, like rabbits. I mean, people keep pet rabbits in the house all the time. If you have the right, I don't know if I would suggest doing it in every indoors in every situation. You'd need to evaluate what what you have, but uh, yeah. you know, because you do want to, you'd have to consider ventilation and sanitation, all that other stuff, because you're moving in the same space. But can it be done? Yes, yes, it yeah. can. Um, and there's other animals that you can too. Quail come to mind. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's and there's some other non-conventional stuff that could come to mind too. Oh yeah. My thought would be is if you have an unfinished basement, you mm -hmm. can probably do, I would say rabbits and quails. I don't know mm -hmm. if I'd do chickens in an unfinished basement, but rabbits and quails probably for sure. If you have a single car garage, you could probably do all three of those, no problem. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and pending, if you've got an unfinished basement and, and you're willing to invest in the technology, You've also got like the aquaponics and the aquaculture type stuff. Yeah, um, and there's lots of there's lots of options for that too, right? Yeah, but that's a whole nother that's like a whole nother skill set because then you have to understand dealing with fish and you know, all that. Yeah, stuff. I just noticed there's our botanist. Here. <laughs> um, do you guys want to comment on this? I just noticed this one. Uh, I think that's a good one because that's why I hesitated on the pigs because um, to be, to be quite honest, the small animals uh, with it getting into graphic details, it, it's physically easier, right? You're, yeah. you're bigger than they are. Uh, you can, you can catch restrain and do all the necessary things in a controlled manner. When the animal starts to get bigger and especially when they get bigger than you are, the game is totally different. And that's where, uh, if people Again, have the animal gets bigger, the equipment gets bigger. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And even though I, I think a big thing I would say is because um, that's a good comment of before upgrading to, to cows or upgrading to larger animals. I think that's a, a key point because I mean, Darren, you, you processed your, your bull, which is yeah. a, a big undertaking. But yeah. even though you can, I'm just going to put it this way, you can purchase cows for a reasonable price as, you know, uh, bottle calves and stuff. And that's tempting. But if you've never had livestock, don't plan, or, or, or hunted, I should include that too. Yeah. If you've never done any of that sort of stuff, don't do that. Even even no. if you can get a bottle jersey calf for 25 50 bucks, uh, unless you're planning to take it somewhere because you don't likely want that to be your first experience uh <laughs> processing uh, something even yeah, even still i I'd, I'd recommend against it because you know you're looking at housing that animal so you're gonna have to if that animal escapes at all if you have to go yes. in to give it feed give it wormer give it water um if you have to load that animal up onto a trailer to take it to mm -hmm. a, the abattoir um mm -hmm. it's Again, yeah, it's not like you can just toss a, a leash and a collar on it. No, exactly. <laughs> oh, so, again, really it's, yeah. 
Well, any animal you get, you should read on it first and learn as much as you can and talk to someone that's actually been raising that kind of animal. I mean, I started with chickens, but before I did my chickens, I searched online to see what, what I had to do. I spoke to some friends that had chicken. Like, what do I do? How do I take care of them? Uh, you need to know what to feed them. What can they eat? I mean, it's one thing to know that you can give them the pellets, but what else can I give them, you know, to save on the cost of feed and uh, once they're big enough, how do you uh, put them in the freezer? You know, it, you have to know those things before you start. Um, if you have, if you go and get pigs and you have no idea how to um, kill them and then how to, you know, cut them up and bring them to the butcher, that's one thing. But then you have to gut them and, you know, mm -hmm. cut them in yeah. quarters. Es and especially nowadays, right now, where... Mm -hmm not only the butcher but the processing facilities have filled up and so yeah. it is i've heard so many people that have gotten pigs or gotten cows or gotten other animals at, but they can't find a place to harvest it for them you know process it for them so it's you know if if you're not willing to do it yourself you better make sure you have somewhere to take it to to process mm -hmm. it for you um, and you Mike may have Chris. to think, and you may have to think well in advance on yeah, that. Exactly. This is, this is yeah, exactly. The downside to pigs, because there's a lot of online information, because pigs grow fast, so yeah. you get a lot of meat fast. If you're, um, yeah. but, but pigs grow fast, so you get a lot of meat quite quickly. But uh, you can actually, right now, where we are, like the abattoirs are like almost a year ahead. Well, if the pig right. only takes six months to grow out, you have to have you better have that booked in before you even get the wiener pig. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's another uh, thing to consider. Mike, Chris, you guys have had goats. What um, what's your feeling about goats? Like, would you recommend it to a homestead? Absolutely. Oh. I think they're easy to take care of. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to let you go first, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it, they. As with any livestock, the hardest part is always overwintering, especially if you're up in our climate zone, um, because they they can possibly freeze. So you have to make sure they're they're OK that way. Um, we've got some Nigerian dwarf goats out here and they overwinter just fine. I made a temporary shelter on this new piece of property, so it's not even the you know eight by twelve goat barn that I had before. It's just a, a little shack, and it's breezy and everything else. But they climatize, so they grow that two layers of fur. So they were they were a goat that's able to do that. Um, feeding them is not very hard during the summer. They're easy to keep because you just kind of let them wander around, and most of the food is just all you know eaten off the land. They don't tend to go very far. Uh, we haven't harvested any of ours, but I can't imagine that would be much harder or any harder than like a deer. And I've done that before. So I, all in all, I would recommend goats well before you'd get a cow or something bigger than you, like even mm -hmm. pigs. No, I, I would agree with that. Um, we kind of, we had goats for quite a few years and uh, we had a dairy breed and kind of have some mixed feelings on goats. I think if you're a very small property, i.e. you're going to bring all the food to the goats um, or vice versa, you're a really big property where it doesn't matter if they do wander around and browse. <laughs> um, but if you're a very small property, goats are great because they do quite well with that kind of cut and, and and carry type method of bringing the food to them, whether that's purchasing hay or whatever it is. Uh, if you're trying to keep them where you want them, pasture fencing can be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> uh, and if you're trying to keep trees alive, that can be a bit of a challenge too, uh, especially like you said, in the winter months, because they'll actually switch, like in the summer, they won't necessarily do it, but they'll switch to stripping bark and that sort of thing, which can be advantageous if you want to clear, can be negative if you don't. Uh, the one thing I would say about goats, as a dairy animal, lots of great options. And I'm talking like a homestead scale. Uh, different breeds that uh, have different excellent qualities. But 
I would potentially caution anybody who doesn't already have goats, try the meat first and see if you like it. Because if your herd grows, you will eventually get to the point that uh, you'll probably end up having to process some uh, because 50% of them are going to be boys, right? And you don't need all those boys. Um, and that was kind of part of our thing. It, it's we, we liked it. We didn't like it as much as other meats. To put it that way, and uh, as our herd grew a little bit on the milk side, to get the milk you have to breed. So we were ending up with more and more boys, basically. And so there's definitely a goat mass there, and I don't know what the ideal is, <laughs> but that's just kind of our uh, without going too deep into it. Some thoughts on it, but no. otherwise, yeah, they're small enough that you can process them yourself. But they're also a livestock that tends to be very friendly, almost pet dog or pet or dog like, and so that's another consideration, right? Um, are you okay with that? Some it's people maybe. Some people may have it's a whole mindset you have to get into if you're getting into farming of any kind like that with yeah. livestock, because mm -hmm. it's it's a totally different mindset and way to look at things. But to touch back with the goats, like I, we let them free range on our property and we didn't have any fencing other than their their pen it was like maybe a 20 foot circumference so it wasn't huge but it was enough for them to have a little area if we wanted to shut them away and we were going away um but i mean you definitely have to fence your garden he's right on that we had it was what was that uh that tree that they ate up that nut tree oh um, there was a hazel. a witch hazel tree and they just ate through it like nothing i couldn't keep a fence around it they they were adamant once they got a taste mm -hmm. but um for milk i'm i'm lactose intolerant and i didn't develop that until later on in life so i got used to as a teenager having a popcorn bowl size bowl of cereal every morning <laughs> which may not be healthy i guess looking back but still i i liked my milk <laughs> and i couldn't i couldn't do that anymore but the goat milk I found was, was fine. I, I had no issues with it. And one of the reasons we chose the Nigerian dwarf was because the, the fat content's higher. So it's closer to mm -hmm. cow's milk. And I didn't nice. taste any difference at all with the, the milk. So it was really a cool experience that way. Cool. Cool. Nice. I'd probably uh, add one other thing about goats and maybe maybe bigger livestock like goat sheep cows that kind of thing and it's not a hard fast rule but if pending your resources because it, it's all in relation to how much land with those animals it's all in relation to how much land you have if you were starting out and this is a tough one because if you've started out you've never really experienced them then you really don't know but our experience kind of has been our experience has kind of been that uh even though we've had cows we have sheep and we've had sheep for a while and we've had goats. We kind of found that we ended up having to choose one. It was, it was not as easy as it sounds to have all of them because they ended up, they compete for lack of mm -hmm. a better way to put it. Yeah. Um, it's just something to think about, right? Because there's, there's a lot of people who do have, you know, a little bit of everything and that can work, but that goes into the sustainability side a bit too. I think you touch on a great point there because we do everything, but it's not heritage pigs and we don't do, you know, we have a limited amount of Chanticleer. We do the meat chickens instead. So, you know, the amount of chickens with us the entire year are this small, whereas we harvest this many chickens because it's the meat chickens and the pigs aren't with us all mm -hmm. year there because we do the feeder pigs so it's again you know we do almost everything but there's a lot of what you always refer to as the put and take aspect of it rather than that more that self-sustaining lifestyle and, and and like for the record we're we're very much like we've been doing this for a long time, relatively speaking, we're very much into having these kind of quote unquote air quotes, sustainable populations, but there's nothing. Yeah. It's that same thing. There's nothing wrong with put and take. It's just. Awesome. In, 
Exactly. <laughs> it, it, it's it's just in in the in the current climate. It's exactly like what we said with cows. Just think about it a little bit with the put and take, because if you if you build your ho- you build your whole homestead on put and take, you you know you don't know what's going to happen in the future because you're yeah. still you're not dependent on the grocery store, but you're then dependent on getting those things. Now, if you can get them, like the pigs, if you can if you if there's somebody farming pigs local that you basically know you're going to be able to get them from, that's one thing. But if you had to, there was a point at least in our area where you could order them in. Yeah. to the feed stores and stuff. If that's your, if that's your, your, we call that your structure of how you're going to work, work it. I mean, we've all seen supply chains <laughs> lately. Yeah. So we, you know, we were doing the meat chickens for a while, and I think it was we did the meat chickens for two years. I want to say before you know the whole thing happened in 2000. Well, 2000 happened and. Thankfully, we were provided the meat chickens that we ordered. However, we know tons of other people who did not get the full amount they ordered. So it mm-hmm. totally would have affected, you know, the their end season harvest. Uh, I think that's, well, not I think. I know that is also why we do the Chanticleers as well and incubate them and raise them as well. So it's just that kind of backup to the other. You know, Angie brought up another good point too about having goats up here in Canada. Um, One of the hardest things we've had to do, because we've learned it all from watching different YouTube channels and, and, and things like that, is there aren't many things up here for goats. So we had to, like, for instance, there's selenium paste that you can give to goats that's offered in the States, but you can't find it here. It's not, it's not, you know, legal, we I have guess. To, we have to put out mineral blocks with selenium in it for the cows. Because, yep. yeah. We just found that out too, because like they yeah, have the copper boluses, but we found one that's only for cows. It's not meant for sheep. Okay. However, goats can do, goats can use it. But we had to like research and research to figure it out because it's just not something we can find up here. It's interesting because some of that stuff is cross compatible between the animals. So, for mm-hmm. example, where we get our hay from, um, we bought some cholesterol for our little bull when we had to hand feed him, and it was goat. Was it goat or cow? I'm, I, it was cow. So we, yeah, it was cow cholesterol. So we were able to feed that to our cow. And then I took a trip into Ontario and I went into one of the TSC stores and we wanted to replace it for him. So I picked up some goat cholesterol for him. And I said, you know, I know you gave us cow, but here's some goat one. And he's like, oh yeah, that's okay. He's like, he only had cow because it was what was available in this area. So he said, you know, it doesn't really make any difference whatsoever Mm -hmm. to the animal. It's just, that's what was available. Yeah. We haven't been able to find half the stuff for, for goats. We've had to use cow cholesterol and stuff like that. Yeah. We found the same thing with the, with the goats. It's basically, there is a goat industry in Canada, but it's not very big. Right. No. right. So most things are geared for cattle too, right? And yeah, that would be another thing. Even though there are quite a few people that have goats, uh, when you get kind of looking around, um, that's another one of those things where you kind of are on your own a bit. Uh, we're, we'll say it, we're even that way a little bit with the Icelandic sheep because there's some funny things about them. That they're not exactly like other sheep, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's not a huge community in uh, in right. Canada compared to so. Yeah, there's little, there's all sorts of little things like that to think about. Yeah, it's again where some of the smaller livestock, you still have to think about it, but it's it's either you don't have them as long because they don't live as long, or you're processing them earlier, or they're better. Like chickens being omnivores, they're a bit better buffered to it. Like obviously, right. nutrition in chickens is important, but chickens can eat a lot of different things 
both yeah. what you bring to them and what they can go find themselves, right? So they can buffer themselves. We were watching our geese and uh, we give them sprouted grains during the winter months. Well, they get it all year, but uh, it's interesting now that the snow's gone, uh, they're just not eating as much of it. It's the same sprouted grain. It's spreaded to the same point, but they have the ability they can go out and pick all the little grass shoots that are coming up. And they're choosing that over, they're choosing to fill up on a little bit of that so they don't fill right up and, and leave the grain as opposed to just, you know, filling their crop up with uh, their stomach up with uh, with the grains, just because that's what they want to do this time of year. So that's very when you're kind of on your own a little bit, like with the goat stuff, you end up kind of having to look at those finer details and kind of observe your livestock and see what they're doing and when they're doing picking this and when they stop eating that, and uh, makes it a lot more complicated. <laughs> I think that's the great thing about like chickens and rabbits too you can almost free range them uh obviously rabbits would need to be fenced we we did a little rabbit colony but you know chickens can be kind of free ranged versus pigs versus cattle versus goats versus mm. sheep where you know you still need a fence for them whereas chickens will come back to the roost at night so um, we're, I know we're getting a little off topic here for tonight's topic, although it's still a great topic, but, um, ideas, other ideas you guys would have. So if someone only owns... have a guest, nice. Oh, oh look at Say that. Hi. Say hi. Hi. Oh. Hello, my junior. One, one of the. The hardest things we found with goats is that when they give birth or when they, you know, they, they have to have the kids, you have to separate them from the rest of the herd because, you know, they, they can't fend for themselves as much. So they're in the barn yeah. with us for a little while. And oh, then the I other guess. female has now been brought into the barn because she's due pretty soon too. Like now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if someone's looking for acreage, what what suggestions would you have um whether it be interesting ways to find property or uh what to look for on a property or you know because there's there's so many different factors where a person i mean even looking around nowadays some of the properties within your price range are hard to find Unless you have millions set aside for some farms, there there's there's not much available. Nope. So, what would you suggest to someone who's looking to get a bigger property? What I don't know about you guys, but here in New Brunswick, on the website, on the government website, there's a place where you can go and buy very very cheap land. Um, you know, sometimes government will seize land for some reasons or land just get lost or forgotten and people, you know, people die and uh, nobody claims the land. So you can basically buy land for the, for the like what, what it's worth in taxes. Sorry, I had to get coming down the stairs. Uh, yeah, so I, w I was checking on that website the other day, and you, you can get, like, a few acres property. I, I haven't seen them. I don't know if it's, you know, any, like, if the lands are in good condition. I don't know if it's mainly woods or just fields or whatever it is. It might be marsh, and, you know, th there's nothing there at all. But I've seen some lands, two, three, four acres for, like, $3,000, uh, I know you might have to pay for the lawyer after to get all that stuff mm -hmm. transferred and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. it's still a whole lot cheaper than trying to find someone that sells land uh, for about $5,000, if not $10,000 an acre. So and I'm guessing that's you probably your, your uh, county assessor's office. If you go on their website, it'll have a listing for it there. And there's, there's huge, huge, there's a lot of a lot of people that get into doing that too because you can eventually sell it and flip it and stuff like that, and there you have to be cautious though too because 
you can pay the back taxes and then they have a grace period to pay you back if they don't pay you back then the land becomes yours however you're on the hook for not just the title transfer but if anybody is still squatting on the land you're responsible you know for all that part too so um what i i've said from the beginning if you find any piece of land like that that you're interested in doing walk the land go out and take a look mm -hmm. at it right and there could be liens on the land from the government you would be i think on the hook for those as well because mm -hmm. the land becomes yours I just wanted to, uh, if there's a yeah, website for government or bank or repo land, um, I'm not sure if any offhand, probably you guys might know of something, but one website that I was always on, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but I think if you just Google land and cattle company, there was a place in Canada uh, I think it was Northern Ontario and they specialized in acreage. So they, they were basically a land and cattle company that specialized in finding properties for farmers, for homesteaders, that kind of thing. Do you guys know of any that, you know, would be like a government or bank repo in Canada or I don't know if you'd know any in the U S at all, but. Uh, not, I'm trying to think, I have looked at them years ago. Um, I think like Mike said, it's mostly through your township or whatever municipality yeah. they have things yeah. set up. Um, but you can get into some trouble with that too. I, I think for advice on somebody looking for land, I think the first thing is have a concept of how much you, how much land you want and what you'd like to do. This kind of goes back to the cow versus goat versus chicken topic, right? If if yeah. you want cattle, then, you know, two or three acres isn't going to cut it. No. <laughs> um, you're going to want something more substantial. Maybe you could get away in a smaller acreage with if goats are your ultimate, you know, biggest thing that you want to do. Um, and the other part would be don't, don't let it get too depressing because right now is not the best Very time true. to be searching. And you, there's, a, there's this balance of, do I move far away for something cheaper or do I hold out to see if I can find something in the area that I want to stay in, right? Like that's a huge lifestyle shift, even if you're not homesteading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's very true that it can be depressing. I know when they were talking about further restrictions in Quebec, we started looking around and I was looking out in Alberta, out the East coast for somewhere to move to. And it was like, Oh, there's nothing available in the price range. I'm thinking. So, you know, all of a sudden it, it can become like, you know, the dream is no longer achievable, but again, there are always options out there. There are always mm -hmm. other people selling privately, not mm -hmm. through realtors. There's other realtor sites. There's um, options of renting to own. There's options of buying land and working the land and then moving to it. There's, mm -hmm. you know, thinking outside the box and not just, I need to move to this kind of setup right away, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you do need to take a few steps to get there. I think it was, uh, maybe Josh and mountain roots. Uh, he had a video lately. Well, I say lately, I've seen it lately. I think it came in my, my YouTube page there where he was talking exactly about that, how to find land. And one of the thing, I think it was him that he said, you know, look around. There might be a land somewhere that's not even for sale, but the owner doesn't even care about that part of land. You might be able to go to that owner and say, hey, you have a piece of land there. Would you be willing to part with? If so, what's the cost? Like, how much would you want to have? Would you take uh, there where we're talking about him? There he, <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, he heard us talking about him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, 
my, my friend sells, he, he found a land in, it was eight, eight years ago. He went to the guy that he heard a guy had land for like $30,000 for like 50 acres. He went to the guy and he says, look, I have $20,000. Would you sell me the hundred acres? And the owner said, yes. So he ended up with a hundred acres for 20. Well, it, it came down to $18,000 for the land that he ended up negotiating for. So you never know. Just go talk to someone. If you see a land somewhere, talk to the owner. Maybe they, they're yeah. willing to sell a part of the land. And there, There's some people who are thinking about it who haven't put it up for sale. That, mm -hmm. And Patrick That's makes a great advice. point here is yeah. don't go over budget because mm -hmm. there are so many things that will come up, whether it be tractors, equipment, infrastructure, water lines, fencing, uh, animal vet bills, uh, feed. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, and you don't <laughs> want to be that negative oh cycle. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Because there's always something the other... breaking on the tractors, and they, they're not cheap to, to repair. So, no. you know, 100 bucks here, 200 bucks there. and <laughs> It adds up. It does. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and again, I, I know there's more people who've come in and joined us and have left. And I want to thank everyone for being here. And thanks for coming in. Uh, again, if I've missed your comments and all that, I apologize. Uh, if you have a question, throw in capitals or put question and then write your question out. And we'll uh, definitely do our best to try not to miss it and answer it. I think too, just uh, on this, on the topic Kijiji, of yeah. um, Kijiji is another one that, yeah. And like there's so many tons of places not in the mainstream where you can find property. Mm -hmm. I think too, um, going back to the previous part of the conversation about like, kind of getting an idea of what you are comfortable with or want to do also really helps because when you start looking at property, that hundred acres could, you know, really hook you in. <laughs> Who wouldn't want a hundred acres? Exactly. But you've got to ask yourself, can I actually, could I actually deal with it? Because you yes. might be better off with five acres. Not, not, not everybody. This is very, very individual, but you may be better off with five acres that you can do, something really well on provided you don't have any restrictions for what you want to do look into that too um as opposed to getting the bigger property and mm -hmm. you can totally use utilize it better too so we're on 13 acres but i think we only utilize about i want to say five or six acres for everything so it's one of those that you know you think you need all this but you may only need this mm -hmm. and even if you have a bit smaller, again, say you start doing the gardening, you can work on vertical gardening or mm -hmm. utilizing the space a lot better for your gardens to be able to maximize efficiency within it. Mm -hmm. And resources too. Because if you, if, you, if you have uh, 100 acres and you do have cows, for example, fencing is still going to be a, a cost but it yeah. may be a lot cheaper than trying to fence a hundred acres for sheep. Exactly. Oh, I've, I've just finished off some Guinness. I don't know if anyone else is actually drinking or not. I'm on water. It doesn't happen often. Water. Oh, that looks like some crown there. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> My brother wow. just got uh, gifted some Hennessy. No, is it? I think it was Hennessy. It was like a two hundred and fifty dollar bottle of, of uh, something. He never drinks Hennessy. He's like, "Oh, I'm gonna save that. That's gonna be my special occasion." <laughs> nice. <clears throat> yeah. So there's like, again, it's I think thinking out of the box, mm -hmm. uh, asking around, talking to people. Um, mm -hmm. Ask, ask, ask. Because you know, what's the, the worst that the can most, happen? Like if someone you don't says do no. anything, you don't say anything. 
Exactly. You definitely are getting it, right? Yeah. 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 And Very true. Um, I mentioned in my one video too, like we were renting half this house for three years before we bought this property. So we, we bought it off of Bridget's sister and we were living in half of it. We were suffering in confined spaces for three years until we bought everything. But that enabled us to build up the down payment and put up some money aside and actually start working the land and knowing the land before we were, before we actually bought it. So. Yeah, that's a pretty good situation actually to be able to do yeah. that. Yeah. That's another thing like you were talking about, like renting it. I know my dad used to do land contracts with uh, certain, you know, farmers or whatever. And he had uh, a house on, I think it was 10 or 20 acres. And he was just had a land contract with the, the owner. And you'd be surprised how many people would be agreeable to that because if you default on it, they just get everything back. So they you rented it for the entire time. It's like a layaway program, really. Yeah, yeah. For those of us who grew up poor, getting our stuff from Kmart for Christmas. <laughs> just me? Okay. <laughs> I remember Kmart. I remember Kmart uh, yeah, I was young when I remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, do y'all remember the Pioneer, that restaurant? Was it the Pioneer? Ponderosa. Ponderosa? They still oh, yeah. have that down in the States. Do they yeah. really? Heck yeah, they do. They, and Olive Garden. It was like the their trademark was making sure you you had those perfect grill marks on the steaks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite places to eat, uh, either Bob Evans or the Cracker Barrel. Oh. Those are just, just down home good food. Man, <laughs> I, I you guys probably never went there, but there was. I want to say it was Sneaky Pete's Upper Canada Mall in Newmarket, Ontario. Sneaky. When I was younger, uh, if you went to Newmarket in Upper Canada Mall, when I was young, there was this restaurant. I think it was called Sneaky Pete's. And they made the best grilled cheese sandwiches anywhere. So... Every so often when we would go to the mall, I think my mom and dad would take us like right at lunchtime so we could get some of those grilled cheese sandwiches. And that was just epic. <laughs> yeah. That's a good memory, though. I know. It's, and then there was another place in Newmarket that, ah, oh, I don't remember the, the name of it, but they did halibut fish and chips. Best halibut mm -hmm. anywhere bar none i have tried halibut everywhere and this place like rocked but they had like this stuffed marlin up on the wall so you'd sit you'd go up to the counter make your order and you'd sit at like these old school desks going down the wall and they had lobster crabs and the stuffed marlin up on the wall and then you could go up when it was ready grab your fish and chips come back sit down at your school desk and eat it and that was that's cool. Yeah, that was at the same time as we used to go to that plaza because there was the consumers distributing. Oh, boy. I remember oh that. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I used to, the one, the one place I miss that I could go to when I grew up, and you, you can't find it anywhere up here for sure, but there was this home just like, a family-owned restaurant, but it was it was a Coney Island, and nobody up here knows really what a Coney dog is, and so it's just. And then, I, if you actually look into it, Coney dogs, which is basically it's in Michigan, it's different than than New York, and it, it ranges from New York, Pennsylvania, and in Michigan, a Coney, a Coney dog means something different or it's made different in each place like it's evolved into its own thing 
But in Michigan, they have this uh, meat company called Kogel's. And so they make all, these all beef German style Wieners. And so it's got the like the skin on it. So like it's a hot dog, but when you bite it, it snaps. It's got that, cool. you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's so good. It's so good. That's kind of like when I was on uh, Bland's Promised Land Ranch the other night doing a live stream with them. And we started talking about chili and whether there's beans in the chili. And apparently you don't want to discuss beans in the chili with anyone in Texas because <laughs> yeah, you can get it, a fist fight that way. It can go all bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I used to have an army buddy. He was from Texas. And I'd find all those little trigger points and we'd get out to the bar and get them drinking. And I'd just start poking. <laughs> Apparently, they Michigan. Are. Oh, so good. <laughs> oh, you're killing me. Like I, I go home. That's I'll, I'll have immediately the first place I go to, and I'll have like five or six. I don't care how sick I am after I'm eat, done eating that many. I, I'm having five or six. I'll take them home, eat them cold. I don't care. <laughs> Oh, the yep. Zellers too. There was always a restaurant in the Zellers. Mm -hmm. I remember, remember eating that? there a few times too. I remember them shutting down not to, uh, in town here. Um, 2012. Yeah. I think. And every, when everything went on sale, I mean, I went there and purchased a bunch of shelves and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I still have them today. Yeah. One My, thing I remember eating when I was a kid, um, it's crazy, but it's uh, McDonald's, those little pizzas they had. And those disappeared. Oh, like, yeah. Those were my favorite, and they just disappeared. Little... It makes me wonder what happened. Like, was there anything wrong with the pizza that they disappeared so suddenly? <laughs> kind of like, I don't know. It was weird. <laughs> yeah, no, it was uh, Target from the States bought it all up thinking they would take it over and right. then they realized no we spent trillions of dollars and we're not gonna recoup it so they just claimed the, the loss <laughs> ran away they uh, they they spent more than their uh, budget would allow yeah <laughs> and then we they exactly happened to everybody recouping it. yeah <laughs> zellers was already kind of crashing anyway and going downhill oh man it's a shame too, man. Cause like the Super Kmart's that back home, same thing. I used to love going into Super Kmart's cause you find good deals. They had some of that Chinese knockoff stuff too, so you get the cheap stuff too. It's just all sorts of goodness. Nope, we just Walmart crashed. killed everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think Walmart's the same company that owns Sam's Club in the states, and they're the same company. I think, I believe, that owns Costco up here. It's like just one huge conglomeration. Could be. Consolidation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I remember pizza. being in the paint business, and there was one company. God, I can't remember right now. Um, they bought up so much that they actually bought a company that we uh, supplied. We, it was one of our suppliers. And then they had to sell it because the government said, no, 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 you have too much. And so they had to sell off, I think it was Para Paints that they had bought. And they had to sell it off because they owned too much. I think it was uh, the same company that owned Sherwin-Williams. Just uh, hmm. one massive big corporation. Hmm. Chinese food? I don't remember that I at all. I don't remember that one. No. <laughs> okay. I do remember the Pizza Hut, though. Yeah. We went to Pizza Hut quite a bit. Mm hmm. Yeah. It used to be like fine dining. I'd take my dates there. <laughs> Between that and Swiss Chalet. I don't think they have Swiss Chalet anymore, Pizza do they? Hut had a reading club? What? Yeah. Angie says Pizza Hut used to have a reading club. Like a book club? I guess so. Like it was like if you read if you read so many books, you'd get like a free pizza or slice of pizza or something. A uh, free pizza for uh, Was that like 
you know, the paper menu that was on the table under like the. It's called like the Reading Rainbow Club or something. I don't know. That's crazy. Huh. Yeah. Uh, See, James yeah, knows. We don't, we don't have a Pizza Hut around here anymore. They all went no. night night. Okay. The only thing within an hour of us is a McDonald's. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it Look, everyone football. knows, but I don't remember that at all. Look, everybody yeah, knows either. this. Yeah. Is, is this Tweet one of those, uh, what do you call them? Uh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yes, of course you, you speak Mike. That's um, crazy. <laughs> Mandela effect. Is it like a Mandela effect? <laughs> That's wild. Michigan. Was it a U.S. thing or like? No, I didn't. No, Angie's Canadian. She's done it. She was telling me about it. I didn't know about it. I don't remember that at all. They still do it in Michigan. Yeah. Then again, I don't read, so it makes sense. That's why. I what do you mean you don't read? <laughs> I don't read books. <laughs> you don't read books? I don't read books. Why, why not? I hate reading. What? When I was what? in school, I go straight at the end of the book and. Try to wow. guess the questions. That was oh. one of the fights Angie and I used to get into all the time because I'd find a book series or whatever and I'd get into it and then you just couldn't pull me away. It was like the climax to the end of the movie, but it would last like three hours because you got to read through every page, you know? So I'd be stuck in those books. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny because I love books. Uh, like to me, uh, like one of my favorite was Treasure Island. It is still yes. like the, but I actually read Moby Dick. It took me, I want to say six tries to get through it before I actually did. But it goes from like first person to third person to screen right to play right to like back to first it's, person. It's it was like, once you get through the first, I want to say five chapters, then it calms down. But the first section, the first few chapters jump around so much. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've never, uh, never really been, I read a lot, but I've never been uh, big on reading like fiction type books. I'm sure you can guess the kind of books I read. Well, <laughs> Book on squash. Does it, does it deal with squash? <laughs> Some of them maybe. <laughs> Just uh, memorize uh, information. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll read book about uh, gardening and you know books about hunting and stuff like that. But beside that, I, I I prefer watching movies over reading books. See, that's another area I could never get into. It's like uh, trapping, fishing, hunting, uh, living off the land, or or you know, survival techniques. I could never get into reading those books. But I mean, used to was the best though. <laughs> but I mean, I, I did grow up with a, a hunting family that I learned a lot of those skills out in you know in the woods themselves. The greatest teacher I ever had for all of my survival skills. Surprising, like nobody can nobody can guess. Even in my family, it just shocks most people. My grandfather was a prolific hunter. Of course, all his four boys, my cousins, you know, uh, their cousins, my, you know, everybody. So everybody's big into hunting, fishing, the whole nine yards. The one person that taught me the most about survival was my great aunt, who was a Girl Scout uh, leader. <laughs> and she taught me so many tricks. It was incredible incredible and to this day i still use a lot of those tricks like simple little things like making uh, a, a campfire stove out of a tin can and some coat hangers and a couple candles that saved me out of tons of times tons nice. of times couldn't tell you there's two great ones right there treasure island and swiss family robinson oh swiss family robinson you know what yeah. another good one was i don't know if it, i've read old man the sea i'll have to no I'll have to go what back about and Tom look. Sawyer? The Adventures yeah. of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. Yeah, Huck Finn. Yeah. Oh, my grandfather used to read those to me. Oh yeah. 
f- for me, that was like awesome. Cause like, you know, I would get right into it. My brain would just go. Oh yeah. You just travel. Just, yeah, exactly. It's, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to the the beginning about uh, homesteading being a lonely life. Because uh, if you like reading, then it doesn't have to be because you can no. uh, travel no, exactly. through, through your imagination. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, like social media is like, you know, impacted our brain so much that yeah. it, it's sometimes like, you know, you want to sit down with a book and you're like, uh, I need to check my Facebook or I need to check YouTube or I need to check. So it, it, it's harder now, I think, than it was than when we were kids. Well, there's more stuff to do. Like, there's more, you know, stuff going around. Yeah. Yeah. Our brain wants to get to. Yeah. It's all designed to grab your attention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's just it. You know what? I've had to caution my kids because they get so caught up in their social media and then people start to, you know, troll them. And they don't know how to handle it. And so I've had to bring them aside because when we were growing up, you know, kids can be hard, but it was never, you know, it was always face to face when they would be like mean to you or you'd hear it secondhand. But it was always like a personal thing when you were like face to face or you were hearing it from their friends or something like that. Whereas on the social media, there's that distance to it. And they get ramped up because there's so many people that it can come from. And so I've, I've had to like tell them, look, if, if these people don't matter in your life, in five years, you won't even remember them. Then don't give them more than five minutes. No, exactly. Yeah. The five for five. yeah once, you, once you leave school, it's. Hmm. It can also work the other way where uh, even though there's so many people who are connected where it just, you put something out there and it just seems like nobody, <laughs> nobody cares. <laughs> which, is, which is the part that people don't talk about much though, right? Yeah. But it, is, it is the other side to the, uh, to the equation. That's so true. Like, yep. Man, sometimes I'm yeah, like, Spengler. hello, <laughs> I love someone Xavier. pay attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, print is dead. A quote from Egon Spengler. Which is from Ghostbusters. <laughs> I swear, I live. I'm I'm from that era that my parents would have card night with their friends and smoke, and so there was that sea of smoke that my oh, brother and God. I would load crawl under, and we were our babysitter was like ABC and and TV, you know, like the old Zenith push button thing where it go click, click, and you had twelve channels or something, you know. So I pretty much quote my entire life through movies and TV shows. I like movies. <laughs> you name a movie, I can start quoting it. It's like it's awesome. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, some of some of the books, I I still love getting back into the books and reading them and trying to just sit down and take my time and enjoy it. The worst part is, mm-hmm. is I've gotten so dumb lately that like reading some of the words i'm like i'm not understanding that word what is that word what does that mean Hmm. i got a better one i can't see the words anymore (laughs) (laughs) i'm having that issue too (laughs) i don't know it's like the past few weeks i'm like yes the trombone effect (laughs) (laughs) what the hell I like, know, man. I when did I get old? Readers, oh, it's brutal. Because I, <laughs> I used to have like 2015 vision, so like better than average. And now I'm like, no, nah, it's definitely not 2015 anymore. It's like, <laughs> oh, I okay. So it, when you're in the service, like one of the things you have to do is you have to go to a range and qualify at least once a year, and. I used to ditch out because I'd get out of work. Anytime a range would come up, I'd sign up for it. So I'd I'd take off and go because you're gone for like the day. (laughs) And so I'd get out of work all the time. And I'd go to like, you know, 30 of them a year. It doesn't matter. But what I started doing is I started earning um, drinking money. 
<laughs> from from people because I could shoot so well. <laughs> so I had really good sight is what I was trying to say because it was just, you know, the peep sights. And, uh, yeah, I can't do that no more. I had to uh, mount a scope on my 308 the other day. <laughs> like, okay, that's getting a little crazy. I'm going to have to fix this. <laughs> that's brutal. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, I was making pizza tonight, homemade pizza for everyone. So everyone got to do their own pizzas. And um, it mm. was Van City Prepper, who has a YouTube channel, awesome channel. Um, so she put uh, a thing up on Instagram about uh, her recipe for individual pizza. So again, I like looked at it and then I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I like expanded it and I'm writing it down. So I'm like, okay, so I don't have to go back to the to the phone. I'll just write it down and then go go off of what I read wrote down. Like, oh, have man. you done this? Have you picked up a book, a flyer, or anything, and then gone Oh shoot. Because <laughs> you tried to expand it. <laughs> I have not done that yet. No. <laughs> Oh crap! <laughs> <laughs> no, that's only you. <laughs> I, I, admittedly, I did that when I had both my BlackBerry and my iPhone years ago, where okay. you know I went from my iPhone and then to my BlackBerry, and then I try to do it on my BlackBerry, and it's like, no. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've actually tried to do it with a book or something. I can't remember what it was. I picked it up and I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> throw it down. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of when I went to sports event and you know, you miss something for a second, something happens, and I'm like, What 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 did I miss? And then I look up and try to see the, the, the replay, but it's not gonna happen. I'm in the middle of a soccer field, like I'm not gonna see a replay anywhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh. my brother Living just the now, me. man. My brother just caught me this morning. So <laughs> it gets like dry out here because we're running the fireplace once in a while and stuff. So um Angie bought me these these handkerchiefs a while back. And I was like, oh that's cool, that's cool. But I actually started carrying it because I can like I, I'm out in the farm and I'm like oh, I want to wipe my hands off. Well, it comes in handy. Or I check an oil on something. Well, now I got a rag. It's it's just perfect. But he caught me like I, I blew my nose and he's like, "Was that a hanky? <laughs> Are you wear, Do you carry a hanky?" I'm like, "Look, man, them old timers were smart, man. Some of this stuff is like handy. Don't judge. Don't don't judge." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, good lord, man. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> man. Yeah. Oh, another good book. There's a couple. Actually, here, I'll grab them. Is Josh still in here? I'm pretty sure Josh has read this. Yeah. He just posted something. Um I think he's he's taken off. He's leaving though. Uh, hurry up. Is he? Keep okay. your powder dry and your hatchet sharp. That one there. The movie came out, but the book is so much better. What is it? Hillbilly what? Elegy. Hmm. Awesome book oh, to read. Elegy? Yeah. So I highly, rec highly recommend that one for reading. We're going to do like a little book club maybe. Um... Oh crap! I'm gonna have to start reading again. I, I, mean, I switched the audio books. You were just mentioning <laughs> that one. Time yes. Uh, here, here's here's one for you guys. Poems that make grown men cry. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, awesome collection of poems and other stuff that. You know, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's like gets you like River Runs Through It or uh, Legends of the Fall or like Fox and the Hound, but you know, it still touches you. <clears throat> I think the the one poem that stuck with me as a teenager 
was uh, Robert Frost's um, something wood. Two paths. I came to two paths and a shoot. I can't remember it now. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. It's that always stuck like with me. Take the old less school. What book is that? Treasure Island. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've I've got a bunch of the ones that are like, I don't know whether they were like my dad's when he was a kid. I'll have to find out where I got them from, but. Yeah, pretty awesome. So. What's that hillbilly elegy about? So, frozen? Just am I frozen again? Yeah. There we okay. go. Yeah, so that one is basically talking about um, yes. people... Um, I want to say it was down in Virginia, down in the Appalachians. So basically all the people that moved to that area for coal mining and other stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then they had to travel around for jobs, but then basically the coal mines and the steel mills all got moved to China. So, you know, people talk about, this will probably piss people off and I'll probably lose subscribers, but you know, people talk about white privilege. When, when you start, you know, reading stuff like this, you, you realize that white privilege really isn't what all it's cracked up to be. So, you know, that talk about the poor, everyone who's poor down in that area where, you know, they've got drug problems, alcohol problems, that kind of thing. So it's basically uh, about one guy who grew up in that area. Uh, if I remember correctly, he was raised by his grandmother and finally got out of the area. But he went to Harvard, became a lawyer and, you know, got his degree and different stuff and made his life a lot better. So... Yeah, <clears throat> there's there's a, a lot of different stories about that. One of, I know you were going down one road, but one of the one of the people that inspired me as a kid was actually uh, pl or played for the Detroit Pistons, Isaiah Thomas. He he came from a very impoverished family, and he carries himself very superbly. He speaks very eloquently. He was a very well brought up individual, and he he's he held my respect as a, a person. <clears throat> but it just it went to show that it doesn't matter where you come from if you you can pull yourself up out of it. If you oh, try exactly. It. Yep. Yeah. One thing that I've realized, or uh -huh, through all my time here on Earth, is that we all have stories. We've all mm -hmm. been through stuff. Every mm -hmm. culture, every religion, every person, every family, everyone has stories. So to try and focus in on one and chastise one for doing something or chastise another for doing something or pick one part of history out is is wrong because you know every every race every religion every everyone has bad parts of their history so you know i think the more we can all get along the better we can make this world it will be it is the goal basically mm -hmm. yeah. um, to be honest the vast majority of us on this planet all want the same things we just want yep. to live a relatively happy life i'm not saying happy all the time carefree all the time or you know maximize our wealth or anything like that most of us just want to exist and be free of some of the the negatives yeah. it's a small percentage that uh, yeah anyways. and it's so true <laughs> that's I, topic. I even love talking I mean, about the homesteading 
kind of community shows it, right? Because yeah. uh, oh, exactly. We're all so diverse, but yet we all kind of just want the same things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love uh, talking about, you know, what bugs me is the whole Quebec versus Canada issue or Quebec versus Alberta issue. But if you sit down with the average Albertan or the average Quebecer, they'll have the same issues, same problems, same concerns, same goals, mm -hmm. same drive, same same interests it's like you know it's the few people in power the few people in the city that the few in the media that try and divide everybody but i guarantee you you sit everybody down and they'll have the same stories same same goals same dreams same interests well, that, that can even go back to the uh an analogy in homesteading too, right? Because uh, there's a there's a drive in a lot of things in life now to 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 keep going, exponential growth, keep accumulating, keep amassing wealth. Like, and you're you're in a constant competition with everybody. Nobody says that outright, but it's there, right? Um, but the reality of it is, we've kind of talked about it on a lot of these roundtables and pieces that. You don't need as much to do a lot. <laughs> no, you don't. No, it's you know true. we don't all need a hundred acres. We don't all need the best technological milking machines. We don't. We don't all need all that stuff. And we actually could all be pretty happy. It's not going to be sunshine and rainbows every day. But if we got rid of that constant drive of competing with each other, the saying might be a little better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's one of the yeah. biggest lessons I've learned from like, there's a, a book out there, Rich Dad Poor Dad, and when it came out, I read it. That's a great one. Oh yeah. my god, man! Like it, it changed, it changed my outlook on things. And so, money will always come and go. I've had more money than I could spend at one time, and I've been broke as as can be, several times. You can always go out and get more money. You can always spend your time to get more money. <clears throat> what you can't do is buy more time. No matter how yeah. rich you are, you get to yeah. the end of the rope, that's it. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So true. So I another mean, thing, I think we're going way out on a limb here, but I think oh another thing everyone needs to do is not only work for someone, but also own their own business. And what you'll realize is I guess the both you'll realize both perspectives of it, you know, mm -hmm. so, someone who works for someone, you'll get to know that feeling and then running your own business and trying to employ other people, you'll get a whole different perspective. And mm -hmm. I mean, that right there is a huge <clears throat> awakening in, you know, how, how we all treat each other and how things operate and you know, how we all just kind of want to get ahead and do better. So, you know, it, it was almost like I'll reference this. I, when I was managing the horse farm, I was kind of like, okay, I'll work harder if you pay me more. And after owning my own business, my mindset changed and I went, I'm going to work so much harder and that will force you to pay me more. It's just, it's weird how that happens. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, It makes perfect sense. But I mean, again, it depends on your employer. It's so totally does. <laughs> I've worked for several places where if you give them an inch, they'll take the mile. Right, right. You know, I, I, I remember specifically one time I was joking with the owner or one of the owners. <clears throat> they said, well, what about this as a quota? Do you think we can meet, meet like, say, 10 units? And I said, man, give me 50. I can do 50. And he was serious. He looked at me seriously. He said, can you? No. I don't even think we can do eight. What are you talking about? 
But I had to like bring his expectations down to reality because all they see are the numbers. So you become quite quickly in a bigger corporation, you're nothing more than a number, a cog in the wheel that mm-hmm. is easily replaced. And so I, that that changed my outlook on a lot of different things. So I stopped because for, I mean, I, as a young man, we all do it. We're like hard charging. We're going out there. We're going to show the world. We can do everything. We're going to be your best employee. We can do everything. Raise me through the ranks. Pay me more. I want that money. And then you get to like, you know, in your 40s and you look at it and you're like, yeah, you know what? You don't want to pay me what I'm worth. So I'm only going to work for what you pay me for. And you have to switch that because how many times would they sit there and say, you know, at a, a factory or whatever, oh, we need you to come in and work overtime. Oh, um, this run wasn't met and finished for today. So it has to be finished. Otherwise, you're going to get backlogged for the week and you're going to have to make it up at the end of the week. Like, well, no, that that sounds like a you problem. Like I, I worked my eight hours. I should be able to go home. But it's that's not how we're looked at. We're looked at bad employees unless we want to give our own free time to make sure that the company doesn't fall behind. But yet we we're only worth minimum wage. And what you said there where you can be easily replaced, it's true because I'm at my job, I like to think that, you know, as long as the system is the way it is, I I can't really be replaced because nobody can do the things I do. But then tomorrow morning, they can decide, okay, well, you're the only one that can work with that software. We're just going to change the software and put someone else in in place. So you, you, I mean, and at some point you want to show them that, okay, I'm I'm a good employee. You can count on me, but don't abuse me. You know, like it goes both ways and you have to find a middle between the both of them. You know, like where, where do I stop versus where will you stop? No pushing me to the, to my limits. This and is I feel an interesting... Oh, go ahead. No, you, you go first. I'll, I'll probably take it in a different direction for a moment. <laughs> well, probably. I, okay, so my dad has owned his own business. My uncle has owned his own I'm, business. I'm just going to say we're, a lot we're of family make it members. quick because yeah. I think we're getting way off track okay, and I sure. want to kind of shut this down <laughs> before we go really bad. <laughs> that, that's I, fair. Always... Mine was actually, mine was actually going to bring it back to homesteading. Because I'm probably going further off the rails. What what we're talking about and what you said, Darren, about the two perspectives, and uh, you 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 got me thinking (laughs) because (laughs) the same thing happens on a homestead, right? If you if you I'm going to pick on the meat bird example or the chicken example because it's simple, not because I think it's bad or good or either, but it's simple, right? If they just are units. And I need 50 units that are going to do this in this much time. You know, that's one way to look at it. But if you look at it as in maybe there's more than just them being a unit of meat, like that's that's the difference between the put and take broilers and the heritage breeds, right? They are not the same thing. They won't they won't give you the same return, but it depends on how you look at it. It comes anyway. back down to you spend your time for money. And so you have to balance it out. How much time do I spend on this piece, this product to earn this much money? Because this is my, how much money I need to survive. So, And that's that's essentially exactly what a small business owner will do. Mm-hmm. So as homesteaders, you can end up in that same boat. Mm-hmm. Well, pretty much, right? Because, uh, well, this is something we've talked about with our economic videos because it ends up being a lot of information and it's only our experience with it. But uh, we we get the comment a lot like, but it's priceless. And well, food is because it's kind of like, if you don't have food, you don't exactly continue to exist. And that's the end of things. But at the same time, you still have to be able to, to keep it going with, and that's going back to the whole thing of like, how big, how much land, what do you raise, all of those things, you have to figure out what's going to work because time, money, and other resources all matter, but then there may be different ways to do it. Like there, there's a lot of information if you're just in the theoretical stage, there's, I'm going to pick on chickens again. 
there's tons of information that tell you how to use incubators and brooders. But how much information is available to tell you how to just get broody hens to do it? It's not, comp yeah. if you've never done it, it's not the, the, the data that's available is skewed to the incubators and the brooders. Very true. But you can do the, you can do the other, but it totally, ch it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a business, except if it fails, then <laughs> hypothetically, if you don't have a safety net, you're, you're done. But how you measure it totally depends on what your expectations are. Right. And I think, again, that's why put and takes not bad, but I don't think that promoting, and you weren't doing this, Darren, so I, I just want to be clear because <laughs> I'm definitely not out to get you on any of it because that's not, that's not where I'm going. But um, promoting just that, which is basically what's been promoted to us, whether it's plants with F1 hybrids and, and now GMOs, whether it's animals with things like broilers or, or even wiener pigs, right? I mean, the yeah. vast majority of them come from the same places. Uh, cattle would be the exception. Cattle haven't really gone down that route yet <laughs> like they're trying but um we've been promoted this thing because you have the break of knowledge and all the people that used to do it the old way are either dead or well, basically they're all dead to put it kind of bluntly and and there's the doom <laughs> at the very end we get to the doom but uh yeah and then you're kind of sold the promise of uh the put and take is the way to go on a homestead because you'll get you'll get the predictable results, but is it's kind of like saying, if you do a small business, do it this way and you'll get predictable results. And we all kind of know that's not true. There isn't one formula out there to say, I, you know, four of us here on the chat, if we all pick a small business for a different, for a different thing, we can just set it up the same way. And it's going to work. It's like, no, you know, you know, intrinsically it's not, but I think right. modern homesteaders walk into it they they see that right it's like if you get the broilers and get the wiener pigs and i don't know do buy buy the hybrid seeds and whatnot i know a lot of people are more for the, the the heritage but do this 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 and this or go one step further like big agriculture use the gmo seeds you'll get x you'll get x results but nobody's giving you the alternative <laughs> Sorry, that's it's totally a bit of a tangent, but it did bring it back around because they're, they're, it's the same thing, right? You, you On a homestead, you're managing a, a business in a way, but your workers are the plants and animals that you're getting to feed yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's just it. And it's almost um, – I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here, but like, you know, what we do with the put and take is, is almost buying into even that commercialization where – it's like I said, shooting myself in the foot. It's not the kind of true homesteading where, you know, each year we buy the feeder pigs and the, the, um, the, the meat chickens, but it, it however, it, right now it works great. for us based on our circumstances and situation. And, it, and it, it's really great because this goes back to the community aspect, right? Because, if the put and take is coming, I, I'm going to use the cow example. If I have a neighbor who has cows and every year has two extra ones to sell because their carrying capacity doesn't allow them to do that, and I'm buying them from the neighbor, it's still put and take because right, I'm just right. buying those cows, putting them on my land, and, you know, totally hypothetical, theoretical example here, but putting them on my land and butchering them in the fall before I have to look after them for the, for the winter. But that kind of put and take is still supporting community. It's still supporting local. It's still yeah. allowing because it does all come back to population dynamics. Somebody has to maintain the population. So if he can keep his cows because he can sell, knows he can sell the extra. So that's where it gets really complicated because buying those pigs, those wiener pigs to grow out doesn't isn't inherently bad. And it's not inherently not proper homesteading by any means. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't, like if you did a video on it, I wouldn't say it that way because it's a very complex discussion. Now I, I will yeah. say this. I think the white broilers, the, the, the broiler crosses, no, nobody, but a, a large corporation can produce them. 
So that would be the other extreme because that would be the one where it's, it's, it is still commercial, right? Yeah. And, and to, to, so you run the spectrum. (laughs) Exactly. I don't think a lot of people think about that, right? They don't, uh, you know, when you, when you're fed, when we're all fed the, the thing that if you, you do this and put this much feed into it by this many weeks, you'll get X. Well, why wouldn't you? That sounds amazing. When I tell you, when somebody tells me in a the chicken example that you, 13 weeks, you'll get a, a 10 pound broiler. And I'm telling somebody it's going to take me 20 weeks to get a Chanticleer. Like <laughs> as soon as I, as soon as I've said that your average person is going to shut down and go, well, yeah. that's dumb. Why would I do that? But they're not evaluating the bigger picture. No, exactly. Which, and when you you're gotta talking, make sure one or two go broody, or you got to get your incubator out and collect the eggs, and mm-hmm. yeah. But going back to like you're procuring your homestead or, or working with what you have or whatever, I think you do have to think about those things because they can they can greatly influence what you need or w- require. Yeah. It's right. like the aquaponics again, example. If you're if you're doing aquaponics in your basement, are you buying all the fingerlings for the tilapia, or are you breeding them? If you're breeding them, hypothetically, you could have a closed loop system because they have a lot of babies. But then you've also got to do all that breeder setup. It's not just yeah. growing them out. There's my rant. <laughs> No, and it's so true. And like, again, I think it depends on everyone's circumstance. Um, the more we can work towards community-based and self-sufficiency and, you know, growing our own stuff and that, the better. And mm-hmm. yes, there are, like us, there will be different points on that travel or on that journey where it may not be ideal, but it could be better than what you've done in the past. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's a, it ends up being a collective move in that direction. Yeah. Because you can't have everybody just automatically move to the, Oh, I'm self-sufficient. I raise all my <laughs> own stuff, read it all Only myself. There. Like it's, yeah. that's not even possible. <laughs> no, no, but you also can't have everybody stay down here where it's like, well, we're just going to keep buying the broilers all the time. Right. So yeah. it's, it's like a pyramid. If everybody starts. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <sighs> no. all right, stuff. With that, I think we'll uh, can't end this one. This one kind of went in all directions tonight, <laughs> uh, like crazy, but I hope everyone got something out of it. And I hope everyone learned something and, got some ideas and it kind of peaked your brain and you know got the wheels turning so with that uh thanks again everyone so much for joining us thanks for the interaction thanks for the questions and uh we'll definitely be talking to you soon i think the next round table will be who is it i believe it's me you yeah, okay. Sure. Mike. Yep. So the uh, next um, round table should be two weeks fourth, yep. on me and you acres. Got it in my book. Awesome. <laughs> in <laughs> big print. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks everyone so much for joining us. We will talk to you soon. Take care, eh? Everybody have a good night. <laughs>